Welcome to the Nonprofit Report, your weekly update on nonprofit organizations, issues, and leaders. I'm your host, Mark Oppenheim. Today, we'll talk about domestic violence with guests. Esther Perales Dickman, Executive Director of Next Door Solutions to Domestic Violence, and Trisha Swartling, CEO of The Advocates. So Esther, Trisha, thank you so much for coming to join us. These are always difficult conversations, but so important that we become informed. And I, just to, to set this, this up, and Esther, I'm going to go to you um, um, after the setup. Um, we noted that uh, if, if you look at the, uh, domestic, uh, the National Domestic Violence Hotline, statistics indicate that 12 million people annually, annually, are victims of race, uh, rape, physical violence, or stalking by an intimate partner in the United States. That's 12 million people. That's huge. And a preponderance of violence is directed at women. So uh, Esther, um, let's talk about how you support victims, how the organization came about, because uh, victims didn't always have support um, they could only turn to their families or communities. And uh, if the perpetrators were known members uh, of that family or of that community, it was incredibly difficult. How do you function to help victims of domestic violence? Good morning, Mark. It's very nice to be here with you. In 1971, a woman by the name of B. Robinson Mendez um, was in a domestic violence situation herself. And as she looked around for help, she realized her friends, other family members were also experiencing ab abuse and violence in their relationship. Back in 1971, we didn't have some of the terms that we use today. There were no laws. Um, so there was really not a dialogue happening on the abuse that was going on between partners. And so she set out to talk to friends and said, we need to help women. We need to figure out how to hear from them. And they set up the first hotline in 1971 which is still the hotline we have today, same phone number. And they started um, sheltering women in a garage. And so it was a few women here in San Jose, California that started and really there was no roadmap. There was no technical assistance. They just knew they needed to help women get out of abuse and violence. They didn't know at the time, it would be the second domestic violence agency established in the state of California. And they actually were the first one in the nation to provide bilingual services. And so since then, the services have really been designed to move people out of violence and abuse into safety, into stability, and then ultimately self-sufficiency and a pathway to a better quality of life, always keeping the victim at the center. Um, what the person feels is right for their family is really what we focus on. And that's how we do that work. And this affects all age groups. It affects all people of all religions. It affects people of all ethnicities. It affects people of any social or economic strata in society, any background. It's everyone, isn't it, Tricia? Yeah, I mean, the Advocates is located in a, a rural area in Idaho, central Idaho. So we're quite different from Esther's program, but so we were founded in 1990, so a few years after um, Esther's program. However, our founding story is similar. It was, we had a young, um, a little different, a woman, teenage girl who was being sexually abused by her brother. And um, she was driven to the point where there was no one there to help her. She ended up shooting him, unfortunately, but however, he survived, but she was incarcerated. So a group of local people got together and said, this should not ever happen again. No one should ever be driven to the point of having to shoot their abuser because there's no help available. So the Advocates was founded in 1991 and we slowly grew over the last um, 40 years, I guess, 25 years actually. And you know, a group of people got together, started a hotline, started um, providing women with court support. We would only be able to, at that point to shelter people in hotels. Now, fortunately, I would say we're a full service program. It's really important for us because we're located in an area where there's not a lot of resources and we serve four very rural counties. So we need to make sure we have everything, which I'm sure Esther's program does as well. So everything from 24 hour hotline, emergency shelter, housing is a huge issue in our community. So we've built a lot of transitional housing. Of course, all the programs, you know, legal assistance, um, 
job and life skills training, um, as Esther was saying, helping uh, victims be self-sufficient, giving them the skills, knowledge, education, and information to be independent from abusers is really important. So we provide a lot of financial support, match savings accounts um, if they take financial education. And prevention is paramount as well in our community, working with youth, educating youth in the schools. So, you know, trying to spread a broad net across the community. You know, it, uh, one of the things that we try to do when we set this up, and I have to give uh, Oscar and his team, um, Oscar's our producer, uh, so much credit, is we try to create representative representational conversations uh, for problems that affect every American. Mm -hmm. And what we're, what we're talking about is a problem that is age old for as long as human beings have existed, yet the vocabulary and the approaches are um, to deal with this problem here in the United States uh, are, are very recent. Let's make transparent the stages. And then let's also talk about the differences between serving rural communities where distance is a big issue, where um, it's very difficult to be anonymous within, um, within rural communities. Um, it's much easier in crowded cities to become anonymous, funnily enough. Um, but let's talk about the breakdown of from, from alert to intake to initial protection and then treatment. And also let's talk both about um, the victim and the abuser and the surrounding community, because this is a holistic approach that you're using. So um, who wants to go first? We started with Esther. Trisha, you want to give, give uh, a first take on this one? Well, that, that's a lot of um, things you put out there. <laughs> well, nice that we have a partner here so that, yeah. so that you, can, you can toss it to, um, to Esther. But let's talk about the first piece from alert uh, through intake and initial protection. And then we'll, we'll, we'll move over to Esther and Esther can, can tell uh, her the rest of that continuum. Well, yeah, I think, I mean, it's important for people to, you know, we help people at all levels, all stages, all points of that. So, I mean, it's hard to kind of focus on, you know, not everybody comes to us. You know, we will, we've helped some women who've been um, basically captive and on a ranch for 20 years who've been dealing with it and not been able to figure out how to get out of it. So, you know, it, it's kind of, there's a broad spectrum, but, you know, basically, you know, they may or may not call the police. I would say the majority of our, you know, clients don't come to us via the police. Um, they come to us um, because of a re referral or on their own. So- Or schools or, for, or neighbors yeah. or yeah. Right? Come in a lot of different ways, right? Right. Yeah. Yeah. So we, you know, that's really important that we, we really work hard to make sure that all the service providers and people in the community know that we're available and they can call us any time in the day. And confidentiality is a big problem in a rural community. You know, a lot of people will not come to us. Working with rural law enforcement is a different dynamic. Um, so, but, it, you know, it doesn't really matter. We can help somebody um, at any stage. And they, one thing I like to tell people is the majority of people that we help aren't coming and staying in our shelter. That's, and it may be different for Esther, I don't know. Only about 20% of the people that we help are living in our housing, whether it's our emergency shelter or our transitional housing. They may not be ready to come to shelter. And then during the pandemic, you know, who wants to be in a place where there's a lot of other strangers? So shelter actually for us has been a little bit down, but people are using all of our other services, which primarily is just support. You know, our victim advocates believe and understand the dynamics of domestic violence. And so they can help somebody, you know, learn that, well, this is going to keep happening. And, you know, we're here for you as long as you need us and we'll stay with you and help you throughout, whether you decide to leave your abuser or not. And so they can tap into what I call like a thermometer of services at any one point in there that they need to help them. So it's not like a clear progression for people. Sometimes they come in, just want to hear, um, talk to somebody, get support, maybe go to support group, maybe get counseling. They might need help with the divorce, child support. Um, they might not come to shelter until a year later. So it's sort of like, what do they need? We're here for you at any point in the time of your journey. And you're finding the same thing, right, Esther? I saw, I saw you nodding. Um, th this whole idea of first telling people they're not alone, right. such an important thing. I think, yeah, and, and you know, the ways they connect with us here, it's a very similar situation to what Trish has described. Um, you know, in big communities, small communities, there's still a lot of shame and, uh, and it's very hidden. People find it very difficult to reach out for help. 
the ways they come to us for help is they do call the main number. Um, they call our crisis line, which operates 24 hours a day, seven days a week, or they walk in. We also have a pretty robust walk-in program that serves you know, a little over 1,600 people every year where you don't have to really have a clear plan. Just come to the building between the hours of 9 a.m. and 7.30 p.m. We can help you. And a lot of times, you know, people are coming, kind of as Trisha described, they've been isolated for a long time. They're, tra they're, they're experiencing trauma. They don't really have the ability to process very deeply what's going on. They just know they need help. And like Trisha described, our role is to be there and to meet them where they're at. Sometimes the, the victim comes to us and says, you know, I don't want to divorce my husband. I don't believe in divorce or my religion doesn't allow that. My culture looks down on that. I just want the violence to stop. And as you know, next door solutions philosophy is we meet the person where they're at. We've also had growing numbers of men. So I think it's really important to say that domestic violence not only happens to every socioeconomic level, but every ethnic group, every gender, the LGBTQ IAP community. And so it's something that I think globally is, has been the pandemic that has been there for decades and decades. We only now are recognizing it because of COVID. And we, like Trisha, experienced a drop in our calls. Um, but that's because people are sheltering in place. So I think, you know, part of the challenge is how do you reach out for help, especially, you know, during the pandemic when face-to-face -face contact is not possible. So a lot of us are, have pivoted to virtual services. People are still calling. We had an initial dip in phone calls just because I think people were trying to survive, you know, pay the rent put food on the table, deal with kids being at home. But once that was settled, we saw the increased number and the volume uh, on our hotline and people were actually reporting more violence, more abuse, but less calls to law enforcement. And so that's a really interesting dynamic. And what is the relationship between survivors and law enforcement? That's a question that we always ask ourselves. And, and this is going to be a, a consistent societal issue. The thing that I think is, is, is so interesting is the support for organizations like yours depends on private means. It really does uh, depend on volunteers, uh, people who themselves have experienced uh, domestic violence, uh, perhaps helping others as part of their own treatment regimen. We just completed a poll in which uh, half of the respondents said that they had experienced or witnessed domestic violence, which just speaks to uh, how pervasive this, this issue is. Uh, Trisha, how do you uh, organize the, the support that you provide? You're not getting government funding preponderantly, are you? Well, actually, we do get a fair amount of government funding that fortunately, there's the um, Stop Violence Against Women Act, the uh, uh, Victims of Crime Act, and Family Violence Prevention Fund, and other housing programs that do support domestic violence programs pretty um, highly. During the pandemic, we, um, I think a lot of our programs, because of what Esther was saying, you know, meeting people's urgent needs has been critical, particularly domestic violence victims, either helping them. Um, a lot of them have got, been affected by COVID, unemployment, gotten ill themselves, needing support for housing, rent, paying their mortgage, food, um, you know, child care, transportation. We've had a huge spike in that. Um, and over the last couple of year, year, well, year, I guess it's been about a year almost now for the pandemic, we've distributed over $250,000 in urgent needs assistance. So private foundations and funders have been very generous. They've been continuing to give to us. I hope that's true for Esther's program as well. Fortunately, for social service and humans-centered um, nonprofits, we've been still getting a high level of support compared to some of the other organizations, unfortunately, like the arts and environmental and those types of um, issues have, I think, been suffering a lot. So there's been a lot of support available, um, which has been great because we've been able to help people um, basically stay safely housed, which has been critical um, as far as, you know, reducing stress for more domestic violence to possibly occur. So yeah, there's been actually quite a bit of support for the organizations. Um, Esther, could you talk a little bit about uh, providing culturally appropriate uh, services? Because uh, living in a, a, um, a, a, an, urban, an urban environment, operating in an urban environment, you're dealing with all sorts of different uh, social norms. 
um, and uh, different traditions. Um, how do you function uh, given that you're trying to meet each individual from where they, where they are? Yeah, that, that is a, a definite distinct difference in the San Francisco Bay Area and most of the rest of the country. Um, it's extremely diverse. It's not uncommon for local governments to print materials in 14 different languages. And so we have a highly um, diverse, also linguistically diverse population in Santa Clara County. And like you um, said, Mark, people's beliefs, what they carry with them culturally, ethnically, I mean, differs. And every approach has to really center on what is the cultural norm. Sometimes the norms in our community are not the best, they're not healthy, but we still have to honor that that's where people's starting point is. And this is what people's personal belief is. And so what we try to do is meet people where they're at culturally, offer linguistic services. I'm pretty sure Trisha um, probably uses the same device as we do in terms of we have language access. Our organization serves a high number of Latino clients. So Everybody we hire at Next Door Solutions is a fluent Spanish speaker, um, pretty much. And so I think that's where, when we talk about culture and the role of culture, we just have to think of what resonates, what are the nuances for people to make sense of this dialogue. Healthy relationships are healthy relationships. Respect is respect. And so it's really starting from the point of just being aware of what are the pressures on that survivor when they come forward for help. You know, if they disclose, you know, I'm of a certain ethnic group or a certain religious group, we already know from experience, you know, some of the pressures and, and beliefs that she may already have. But what we try to move to the space of very quickly is safety. You know, is your relationship safe? Is the situation you're in safe? And we can do quite a bit of risk assessment, um, lethality assessment. That's really important for the survivor to know because above any belief, any personal, you know, cultural norm that they that they live with, it's the idea of like, your life might be in danger, which will immediately then move people to the space of what do I need to do to stay safe? And that's, you know, in a smaller community like Trisha's, there's less resources, there's less help, there's less places for people to go. We have five domestic violence agencies in San Jose, California, serving Santa Clara County, which is Silicon Valley. So we're very fortunate, but again, we have 62 beds and collectively get about 26,000 phone calls every year from people who need help. So you can see shelter, we try to reserve that for only those who are in the highest need. And then we try to safety plan and figure out what other options exist for that survivor. But yeah, culture, language, those are all big factors in, in how we help you. We just uh, completed a poll, uh, uh, Trisha. I'm going to ask you how, how things sort out in your area. We asked uh, what two groups experience domestic violence most in, in uh, people's opinions. And the, the top two were women uh, and children followed by members of the LGBTQ community. Um, where do you find uh, most of your domestic violence settles in terms of, of the people who experience that themselves and the people who perpetrate it? Well, it definitely is women. I mean, one in the national statistic is generally one in three women will experience some type of abuse, sexual or um, physical, emotional, financial, mental during their lifetime. So- And Esther, is your, are you finding the same thing? Absolutely. Yeah. So, I mean, as Esther was saying, I mean, abuse is abuse and um, it crosses, you know, all lines of everything. So we pretty much, you know, make sure that we are able to provide services to anyone. Um, you know, we do help men too. We have um, programs in the schools to work with students and, you know, work on prevention of debating, uh, dating violence and teaching healthy relationships. Our clientele um, is a little similar to Esther's in that 50% of our clients are of um, uh, Spanish speaking, Spanish is their native language. And so we make sure that we don't focus so much on the cultural beliefs behind what may be causing the abuse. It's more about providing them the support and services culturally appropriately in their language, you know, helping them with immigration issues if they have any. So, you know, whether there's LBGTQ, um, you know, we have trans transgender people living in shelter. Um, we support anyone who comes to us. We make sure that, you know, the signs on our door are very welcoming and that people are comfortable coming because a lot of these groups have been um, treated poorly in, you know, society in general. And we want to make sure that, you know, 
the advocates is a place where they feel welcome. So nobody, unless you're a soci sociopath, wants to be an abuser. But given how much abuse is occurring, many of us are abusers. How do you heal that piece of it? If, if, if I, as a man, do not want to be abu abusive, but I am periodically abusive, I, I think that that's been a huge challenge in our field because mostly the interventions for people who harm others have been after violence happens. It's been part of the criminal justice process. In California, we have the 52 week program that if you're convicted um, of domestic violence, you must complete that program. We also have a variation of that 16 weeks locally in Santa Clara County, which is if it's not a domestic violence felony level, um, conviction and it's a misdemeanor, you can actually be directed to go to 16 weeks. I think one of the challenges is it's very punitive. It is very much reinforcing the abuser, the batterer, and sort of, you know, holding that person accountable, trying to help them understand their behaviors and, and how to correct those. What we see in California is a movement toward a more healing approach because it's like, um, like you said, a lot of what we find at times is that the abuser, the person who's harming others has also been a victim of abuse early in life or later in life, you know? And so we don't, we don't acknowledge that there is healing and things like therapy, things like support group really aren't common for people who are harming others. That's something that we've pivoted to at next door because we always ask, why doesn't she leave the relationship? And we never ask, why doesn't he stop harming other people? You know, and that's a pivot that we need to have I think nationally, internationally, we are seeing this work in other countries where there's a move to work with men and boys because there's been a lot of focus and even resources for the survivor and the children, but very little for the person who harms. The person who harms is mostly male, sometimes female, sometimes a member of the LGBTQIA community. So I think those are really important changes. And it just means that there's still accountability when somebody hurts someone else, there has to be accountability and recognition of that. But what works with both survivors and people who harm is this idea of like, domestic violence will affect you. We've had a lot of work with Stanford University on how domestic violence affects your health. Also how it affects children. Children typically are witness to domestic violence. They're not necessarily the recipient because of that would be child abuse. And so what we get a lot of is when children are present in a domestic violence situation, they may be exposed to behaviors that will affect them. And we call those adverse childhood experiences is one, one of many things that could happen to children. So we always treat the children from the perspective of they have been affected by trauma. They have witnessed violence. They need to build resiliency. They need to have support, their own therapy to be able to overcome that exposure to violence. That's a big theme in California. Our Surgeon General is really drawing a lot of attention to what are these experience that, experiences that happen to people early in life that result in addiction, that result in criminal behavior, abuse. So it's a whole spectrum of, of activity that happens from very early in life. And Trisha, do you find that, it, that in your neck of the woods, um, you're, you're also uh, finding that the abuser actually um, ends up first getting treat, treatment after the fact, after they've come into contact with the criminal justice system and after they've been tagged? Or are there preventive measures that, that you're able to take um, to proactively raise awareness among abusers that this behavior just cannot continue? Well, I think, unfortunately, it's usually after the fact. I mean, and as you know, um, Esther stated, I mean, abuse is a learned behavior. And for an abuser to decide to change that behavior, they have to be willing to recognize they're an abuser, admit they're an abuser, and commit to addressing the issues that cause them to abuse. So unfortunately, the criminal justice system in um, our area and in Idaho and in, in lots of areas across the country is not um, as strong as it should be about dealing with these cases. And um, typically a lot of the abusers get off, you know, with just a lower charge, like disturbing the peace, which doesn't then require them to go to treatment. So there definitely needs to be a higher level of commitment I feel like on the criminal justice side, prosecutors, judges to actually holding abusers accountable because what we see is that they get off pretty easy and then they just continue to abuse. Now, as Esther said, yeah, it would be great 
to like help them address their abuse issues before. And so we're doing as much work as we can with young people about healthy relationships, what is consent so that people, young people, um, you know, learn, well, that's not okay to, to text my girlfriend 25 times, you know, in an hour or something like that. I mean, that's kind of the beginning of control. Abuse is about power and control. And um, that's what people have learned. And so you have to help them unlearn that or not go down that path. We've been having conversations um, and, and a, an interesting notion has uh, been advanced that violence actually spreads like a virus, like an actual virus, that people are infected by, um, by um, violence and then they pass it on and they pass it on until it is inter uh, interdicted through some sort of an immune uh, activity. And in this analysis, you are part of the immunization process, the healing and immunization process. Do you feel that violence is passed um, on within communities if it is not addressed uh, in, in a proactive sense and in a very conscious sense, Esther? Yeah, I mean, I've got over 25 years of experience in government in several states across the Southwest. And one of the things I can tell you is systems often perpetuate systems. And so the responses in our field have been centered largely on this interaction of the criminal justice process, the traditional stakeholders, whether they're domestic violence agencies, law enforcement, the district attorney. What needs to, I think, change is what is it that the community is looking for? Because we know from the CDC, there are four things that need to happen for violence to end in the community. The individual and, and, and the services to look at the relationship. That's the business that Trisha and I are in. We can help people navigate that. What's your individual situation? How do we help you? But then there's also the community level work. What is acceptable in the community? What is the norm? What happens when a survivor calls law enforcement and there's a 911 call? What is the response there? The community can absolutely take a stand to say, this is a serious crime. We need better responses. We need more resources. And then societal um, sort of a view of like, what do we do in US culture, American culture, that we're inadvertently promoting violence? What are the activities, whether it's media, social media? You know, those are also ways that unhealthy relationships become sort of the norm. And you can just flip on your television set and you see that played out. You know, there's lots of programming that focuses on, you know, sort of unhealthy relationships women bashing other women. I mean, that's, that's pretty much what we, um, what we as Americans consume. It's that shift that we have to make in society to also say, what do we want? What are the messages we want our children to be exposed to? What do we as a, as a nation stand for? You know? And so I think that it's been a rough, I would say the last five years have been really uh, eye-opening in terms of people's tolerance when violence happens against women. Um, because it is mostly women. And so I think that's where we have to look at community level responses and, and sort of the, the action that they want to take. And then as a society, what's our norm? What's our standard? What do we stand up for? Those are and the four things I think we need. Thank you so much, Esther. And, and Tricia, we started with Esther, so we're going to uh, end with you. Um, and before before we get to uh, your, your, your last summarizing content, we just finished a poll, which I found to be very interesting. We asked how tech and social media affects um, domestic violence. And 78% of, of respondents said that it actually empowers perpetrators. Do you have any opinion on, on that uh, issue about whether tech is a good or a bad when it comes to uh, domestic violence? Um, I think it's, I, it's probably neutral because we have seen through the pandemic that we've been able to reach out to clients and offer support groups and services and job and life skills training via Zoom. We've stayed up and open throughout the pandemic because we're a frontline service provider and yes, mask wearing works and um, we've been able to provide services safely in person. Um, so, uh, but that doesn't, you know, for us also being in a rural area, you know, somebody who's, you know, 120 miles away can't come to support group or can't participate in job and life skills training. So tech has helped with that. Does tech make it possible, cell phones, computers, easier for, or I guess, abusers to track victims? Yes, but at the same time, we also have, um, texting apps that young people can use to reach out to us 
because we did a, a survey in our community and young people said, there's no way we're going to go to the advocates. It's just not cool. It's not something that we feel comfortable, but we will text a victim advocate, you know, via our phone if we're concerned or there's something happening to, happening to us and we need help. So, you know, it's a hard uh, line. I think it, it helps on both sides. And, you know, there are things you can do to protect yourself through tech, but um, I would have to say, you know, yeah, it, perpetrators can use it to get to victims, unfortunately, but it also has helped a lot of victims probably get help and advice that they might not otherwise have been able to access. And what is your, what is your summarizing admonition to us all to help, for, for us to help uh, cure domestic violence, cure this country, Tricia? I think, you know, don't judge a victim and, um, you know, people will say, well, why isn't she leaving? And, you know, we hear that all the time and just offer support and understanding and say, I'm here for you whenever you need help. And there is help available and I'm worried about you. And whenever you're ready, you know, help's available. And Don't Esther, you have, away. A, you, have a, you have a final comment or you want to endorse uh, Trisha's? Yeah, I think that's definitely, everyone has a role to play. You know, if you are a, a, a faith-based organization or a church or a synagogue, and people need help. Learn what the resources are in your community and connect people with that help. Domestic violence, gender-based violence are very serious issues that pose a lot of risk to people's safety and health. So we have to shine the light on this issue. So we encourage people to definitely find a way to intersect. Find out in your community how prevalent is the problem. You know, our law enforcement agencies, there's 15 of them in Santa Clara County. Collectively, they get over 6,911 calls, but Shelters get about 26,000 phone calls. So the need is far greater than the, the data may in, uh, indicate. And so again, kind of like Trisha said, offer support without judgment and learn where the resources are. There is a national domestic violence hotline that can connect you with help anywhere in the country. That would be the one number that is really important to promote. So if you see something, say something, mm -hmm. say something. Yeah. Thank you both for sharing your experience. Um, uh, Esther Perales, uh, uh, Dickman, uh, Executive Director of Next Door Solutions Domestic Violence, Trisha Swartling, CEO of the Advocates in Idaho, two very different states and very different areas of different states, one rural, one very urban, but we have the same problems. And this is pretty much the story of America when it comes to civil society, whether we're talking about education, environment, poverty, housing, arts, we're bound together by so much more than that which separates us. Thank you so much for sharing. And thank you, attendees, thank you for coming. Please spread the word. And uh, that's the nonprofit report. Stay safe, everyone. Mask thank up. Thank you.